up and speak his word. Rise up to what you Christ. Rise up this very hour. Rise up with Jesus Christ. Rise up in Jesus' name. Open eyes and heal the lame. Rise up, declare his truth. We're the ones who cannot lose. And rise. We've got to rise. Well, sometimes you got to get out of the hospital so you can get well. Well, if you look at the stats, I mean, come on. Most people die in hospitals, so why go there? That's, you know, just why even, you know. All right, so. <laughs> so. All right, this morning we want to look at some things. <clears throat> um, we get a lot of questions. And many times at a DHT, we'll get questions. Well, no matter what I'm teaching, if I say if you have questions, write them out, it's going to be on healing. That's, that's 99% of all the questions we get. And so <clears throat> there are certain things that we hear that we, in a DHT, we teach, <clears throat> but there are some details that we can't always get to. Just because, honestly, there's, it, it's, amazing. it's so simple, and yet <clears throat> it can get so detailed. And so I just wanted to share today specifically about one of the things that <clears throat> I have found to be, I would say, probably one of the most important aspects. You know, there's things that you have to learn from the Bible <clears throat> that says how to do certain things, what to believe, how to do them, that kind of thing. <clears throat> then there's things that you learn as you do, which you can, if, then when you start reading the Bible, you say, oh, okay, that's the, I, I understand that because... It doesn't point it out, but you once you understand it, you see it. And so a lot of things, you know, people want to come and they want to learn, and they want to learn it all. And they want to give me everything. I want to know everything. So when I walk out of here, I know it all. I can go do it. Well, <clears throat> believe it or not, uh, I may act like it sometimes, but even I don't know it all. All right? So <laughs> I know. It's just, it's a gift. Um, <clears throat> so, <laughs> so, but <clears throat> you don't. You can't learn everything you need to know by sitting and listening. A lot of what you have to know, you, you learn by doing. And so as you take the skeleton, so to speak, and you start doing it, then God fills it in. Now, what you have to be aware of is as it gets filled in, you have to make sure that you're not going back and relying on oh, some old sacred cows or different traditions and things that are not Bible. <clears throat> so... This morning, I want to talk about something specific. Uh, you know, like I said, there's, there's scriptural things, and this is scriptural, you'll see. But then there's also the personal aspect of it that you have to learn how to maneuver or work within the framework of scripture. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> now, so you can turn with me first to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, starting in verse 14, it says, Is any sick among you? Then he gives you instructions. If they're sick among you, here's what you do. Let him, that person, the sick person, call for the elders of the church and let them, notice plural, no superstars, right? Plural, them, pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith, notice, the prayer of faith, not the prayer of doubt, not the prayer of unbelief, not the prayer of begging and crying, not the wimpy prayer. You hear that? <clears throat> the prayer of faith shall. Now you, that's a, and especially in King James, that is the strongest word in the English language in King James Bible. Shall. There is no doubt about it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. So if you add a but what about or what if, then you're going outside the Bible, right? <clears throat> now, it says, shall save, and that word save means to heal, 
or deliver or to make whole the sick. So the prayer of faith shall make whole, shall heal the sick. Is there any questions about that? Right? So if the sick are healed after they have been prayed for, then the person that prayed, prayed the prayer of faith. Is that correct? So now by the same token, if they're not, then the prayer of faith has not been prayed. Do you understand that? Do you see how simple that is? See, once you decide to believe what the word says, everything gets real simple, but all of a sudden it comes right back to go, okay, was I really believing? Did, was I operating in faith? Did, because the prayer of faith will heal the sick. So if the sick are healed, it was a prayer of faith. If the sick aren't healed, no prayer of faith has been prayed. Does that make sense? Okay. I know that's not pleasant <clears throat> because it makes you face your own you know, uh, <laughs> deficiency at times. Right? Because I've, I've had people say, but I prayed the prayer of faith and they didn't get well. You're a liar and God's not. See, that's right there. How many of y'all know we were watching Dr. Summerall this morning? I said, just said. <laughs> so, okay. Well, <clears throat> he says here, <clears throat> and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And that's some pretty good promises right there. Right? Then he says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, uh, notice he's saying here, he just told the sick how to get healed. Then he says, confess your faults one to another. <clears throat> and, he, and he says to pray for one another so that you may be healed also. But the actual healing here in the second part is not necessarily physical healing. It has more to do when it says confess your faults one to another. That goes back to what Jesus said. He said, if somebody offends you, you go to them and you talk to them. <clears throat> and then hopefully you're restored. That's, what, that's the idea of going and talking to them. And so the idea here of healing, see, we have to realize only in Western countries, when we talk about healing, do we automatically only think of something physical. We have grown a little bit to also think that it can include mental or emotional, right? <clears throat> but we also have to realize that healing can also include relational, right? Relationships. And that's when he's saying here, confess your faults one to another. Go to them, <clears throat> confess your faults, pray one for another. You pray for them, get them to pray for you, and you are healed. Your relationship is healed. Do you, do you understand that? <clears throat> now, you have to remember, James is a primer for Christianity. Everything you need to know about how to live the Christian life is in the book of James. All the basics are there, right? Tells you what to do, how to do it, and everything. So that's, that's why this goes on this way. But now notice this last part. He says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. <clears throat> now, we're going to get into what I want to talk about this morning, because this morning, specifically, I want to talk about divine healing and human emotions. Now, I'm not talking about emotional healing. Do you hear me? I know we just mentioned that a minute. I'm just trying to get past that, but I want you to realize it. I'm not talking about emotional healing. I'm not talking about mental healing, uh, you know, healing of mental issues. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm, when I say we want to talk about divine healing and human emotions, I want to talk for a few moments about the role or the impact that human emotions have concerning divine healing. In other words, well, the last part of it would be very simple this. We want to talk about divine healing and human emotion, help or hindrance. So does, do emotions help or hinder divine healing? Well, it could be either way, right? But usually it hurts or hinders, usually. And I'm talking about most of the time, minuscule amount of time does it help. And I, we'll, we'll talk about that. <clears throat> so the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now the word <clears throat> pray here, especially up in the prayer, word of prayer of faith. It means, it's uh, number 2172 in the Strong's Greek Concordance. It means, listen to this, to wish, and by implication, to pray to God. Now, if you look up this word, it's used six times in the Gospels. And, I think it's in the Gospels. But it's used six times. Four times, it is translated wish. 
Only twice is it translated pray. Right? One of the times it's used wish, used as, or translated wish, is in 3 John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So he could say, I pray. There also, it's the same word. Right? Now, the reason I'm saying this is because I want you to realize <clears throat> there is an aspect in praying. Why, what are you praying for? You're praying for something you wish to happen. So the prayer is not in the praying, it's in the wishing. Am I making myself clear? There is an, an inward thing that has to be done, right? Now, it's not just words, it's not just a formula, right? Now, notice this. <clears throat> in verse 17, it says, Elias, or Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. Now, notice, subject to like passions. Same emotions, same desires, same, he was a human, right? <clears throat> As we are. And he prayed earnestly. You could underline that. Prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Then in verse 18, it says, and he prayed again. So twice here, it says he prayed, right? Just before that, it said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, and now it relates to Elijah here as a righteous man whose prayers avail much. Okay, are we all in agreement, right? And we know that, right, that uh, he was not special. He was human and had the same uh, you know, pros and cons right, that any human has, right? One minute he's very bold and killing the prophets of Baal and all this kind of stuff going on, and the next minute he's running from one woman. Gives you an idea right there. That one woman was scarier than 450 prophets, false prophets, okay? So now, he says, <clears throat> and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now, if you look at the word prayed earnestly, it's actually really one word. We say prayed earnestly, but the idea is earnestly, and the inference is in prayer, okay? But the word there is a Greek word, and it's number 1754. I'm giving you these so you can look them up and so you know I'm not just making stuff up, all right? And it is the Greek word energeo, which is where we get the word energy, right? So it says he prayed with energy, right? <clears throat> now, and it says that this word here, it means to be active, it means to be efficient, or we could say effective. See, the word effectual, people don't always know what that means, but it's, it basically means to be effective. So you can pray an ineffective fervent prayer, and it would not avail much. But you can pray an effective fervent prayer, if you're a righteous person, and it will avail much. Now, first off, how do you, how do you become righteous? In Christ, isn't that right? We, become, we get his righteousness... It's not our righteousness, so we don't base our prayers on what we have done. Right. God, I've been faithful. I'm in church every Sunday. Why don't you heal this person? I'm praying, God. See, uh, I, I did this. I tithe regularly. God, I, I help support missionaries. See, no, that's not effective. Why? Because that's not the prayer of a righteous person. A righteous person does not try to uh, somehow leverage their good works to get benefits. Okay? All right. <clears throat> now, it means to do or be effective. It means to be mighty in. It means to show. The word here is for self. It actually means to, to uh, put forth effort, right? And it means to work. Actually, one of the subtopics that I'm looking at even at this point is that faith works. Because, okay, I have to put the emphasis on the right, how do they say it? Put the right, I have to put the right emphasis on the right <laughs> syllable, okay? So I have to put the right emphasis. Faith works because faith works. Do, do you hear that? Right. See, the reason faith works is because faith works. In other words, there is a work in faith. Faith is not stand by, twiddle your thumbs, and expect God to drop food on you. 
uh, or you know, money on you or something else. God gives us the book of Proverbs to know how we are to live diligently in our life with wisdom. Christians should not be the benefit or the recipient. Really, their lives should not be based on being the recipients of God's power and his miracles. We are to be the purveyors of miracles, not to be the needers of miracles. Does that make sense? Amen. So, in other words, we are to be giving them away and not always having to rely on them, right? Now, believe me, that's a better life, right? It's not as good a life when you have to have them. It's always better to have them and give them away Amen. than to have to have them. Amen. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, <clears throat> notice this. Uh, there we said, and he prayed again, verse 18, and the heaven gave rain, the earth brought forth her fruit. Now, the word prayed there is a different word. So he uses different words. That's the, the drawback with the English language, and especially the King James is the way it's translated, because they translated different Greek words into the same English word. But when you go back in and look at the different words used, it gives you a whole different understanding of what was going on. So the word here for prayed, it says he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain. That word is number 4336, Strong's Concordance. And it means to pray to God or supplicate, including to worship. Now think about that. So in other words, when he prayed, there was worship involved in his prayer. Right? Now you remember a while back, we talked about the praise cure. And we talked about the worship cure. You praise God for what he has done, going to do, but you worship him for what he is. Amen. Amen? And if you're going to be a partaker of his divine nature, then what he is, you start to become. And as you worship him, you become more like him in those same areas. Amen? Yeah. Now, <clears throat> so if we're going to talk about divine healing and human emotion, then we have to figure out when is it a help and when is it a hindrance. Now, more people... Pray for love one or for the healing. And I'm talking about physical in, in this narrow case right here. But more people pray for healing of loved ones and don't get results than the number of people that pray for loved ones and get results. Yeah, think about that. Beloved, that's not how it's supposed to be. Amen? Now, I had to learn this myself. And hopefully if you hear this this morning, and I talk about it at times, but I've never been able to spend much time on it. So today I really wanted to bring this out because... I'm seeing in some of the prayer requests we get, people that have been through a DHT, they've studied, they've seen results before, but then they get into this situation. And because apparently I didn't state it strong enough or give enough detail or whatever, many times they don't, or for whatever reason, they don't hear it and they get stuck. And so I really believe that if you hear this today and start to apply this, you'll get a breakthrough. I really believe it in, in, in every area, but especially in the area of ministering healing to other people or even receiving healing. It would, it would be a breakthrough. Now, <clears throat> so if more people pray for their loved ones and don't get results than the people that do get results, what is the result? Teach, teach more faith? Well, that's what Kenneth Hagin did, taught it his whole life. And yet today, nothing against him, you know, thank God uh, he taught faith, Amen. <laughs> Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, the problem is uh, there's more sick people today than there was before. Amen? Yeah. And a lot of people today, they're only sick because they found out what they had was a sickness. Oh. And they had to watch TV to find that out. Anyway, okay, so. <laughs> so. <clears throat> now, but there's still more sick people than there are healers. Now, I'm talking about Christians that believe in healing and minister healing to people, all right? Now, <clears throat> remember what Jesus said. Now, and we've made emphasis on this before, that there was many times that Jesus used his faith to heal people. Whenever there was faith by somebody else, he recognized it. He would commend it. But he never told a person, sorry, you don't have enough faith. Come back later. Go get some more faith and then come back. He never did that, right? So... What did he say? He said, Your, thy faith, King James, thy faith has made you whole. Isn't that right? Your faith has saved you. So your faith. He said, uh, your fa uh, yeah, your faith has made you whole. Your faith has saved you. Your, um, I mean, just, uh, we can give you over and over again. 
he said at one point, great is your faith. Remember, they told the woman, the Syrophoenician woman, great is your faith. Isn't that right? So he said all this about faith. But now notice he even said one time that he had not found so great faith. That's what he told the Roman centurion. So the faith, now get this. Here's, and as I was, this has been building. And that's what I, I, I watch God do it sometimes is he'll give it. It's amazing. It's just like he, Jesus talked about the kingdom. The kingdom starts as a seed and then grows. God will give me a thought. And I'm kind of like, hmm. And then I'll go look some stuff up. And like, oh, okay. But he gives me that thought. And then that thought will start to, and it's funny because what I learn, then he grows it not based on what I learn, but what I'm learning kind of fills in or bolsters it, makes it, uh, gives it scriptural um, proof, right? And so then he's sharing, and that thing starts to grow, and I'm, I'm watching it grow in me with, with the idea that he gave me originally, and then the scripture is like the watering of it, the washing of the water of the word, the Bible says, and so that, that word, that scripture, wa uh, waters it and allows that thought to grow. And then eventually, I have to decide, uh, usually by asking him, okay, is that for me, or is that what I'm supposed to preach? And sometimes he goes, yes. Okay, so, you know, like I said, I don't know it all. I'm still learning. I'm still growing. Amen? So, now notice, though, Jesus was love personified. Is that right? So everything he did was love. Isn't that right? All right. Now, remember, and this, this was the, the thought seed that he gave me. The faith that brought people to Jesus that got them healed was the faith that got them healed. Isn't that right? So the faith, now think about this. If, if, and I actually mentioned this this morning so you can tell where it was coming from. Um, the faith that got them to go to Jesus was the faith that got them healed. So they could have got healed even back before they got to Jesus if they had had faith in God to get healed where they were. But see, they had faith in Jesus. And see, they had faith in him not like we do, right? We have faith in him because we know the whole picture now. But they didn't have that. All they knew was he was a prophet, he was a healer, great power, things like that. That's what they knew. But they, they saw him that way, but they didn't see him the way we see him. And, and they definitely did not have the relationship that, that we do. Why? Because our relationship with him is spiritual, whereas theirs many times was actually physical. Isn't that right? Now, that's why Jesus said, remember that once he said, you know, uh, I'm not going to, uh, Thomas said, uh, I'm not going to believe until I stick my hand in the wounds and into the finger, and you know, the holes in my hands. Remember that? And Jesus said, you know, blessed are you that believe. Remember what he told him? He said, you know, blessed are you that believe that haven't seen. Isn't that right? And now, notice that's us. So our faith is greater than some of the apostles that actually walked with him. Amen? That's every believer. Every believer. See, we start where they ended up. Do you realize they had to get there? But we start there. So we start with greater faith than they built to toward the end. True or false? Amen? All right. So now... See, here's the thing. That's the same way it's done today. What I mean by that is this. People have faith in me that I have faith in God. And if they think if they can get to me, then I can get them healed because of my faith in God. And it's true, and it works. Now, that's not my goal. My goal is not to get people to have faith in me or have faith in... I don't want people to have faith in my faith in God. I want people to get faith in God because, especially Christians, because you already have that but it's time for you to use it. Amen? Now, <clears throat> so many times <clears throat> people had faith, but what they didn't have back then was they didn't have power. They had faith, but now notice faith, and like Smith Wigglesworth said, um, <clears throat> well, actually it was John Lake that said this. He said, between faith and power, always go after faith because faith directs power. Now think about that. Between faith and power, always go after faith because faith directs power. Smith Wigglesworth said, faith is the train tracks that the train of power rides on, and wherever you lay the tracks, power 
will follow. Now think about that. How do you lay the tracks of faith? You get in the Word of God and find out what God has said about any topic. And any topic that you find out what he has said about it, now you can have faith in that topic, in God, on that topic. That's the way I should say it. Does that make sense? So if you need healing, then obviously you should find out what God said about healing. And when you find out what he said about healing, then you're laying the tracks for the train of power that's going to bring the healing to you. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, you know, I'm, I'm blessed, I'm telling you, um, and I, you know, some of the things that bring me some of the greatest joy is, you know, I, I, we knew Steve Hill. We weren't close friends or anything, but I'd met him a few times and talked to him. And Steve Hill from Pensacola Revival is who I'm talking about. He had a church here in, in Dallas. And he said that if you're going to preach the gospel, you should preach it at a level that a six-year-old can understand you. Right? And the other day, I got a video that my wife showed me that someone sent to her that she talks with um, on Facebook or something and sent me a video of this little, little boy. I can't remember how old he was, but he was little, little boy. Uh, was kind of barely talking, kind of. I mean, I could, I could understand him. But he was walking around with headphones, and he said, this isn't working, this isn't working. And so she, he was trying to get her to fix it. And he, she said, well, and she recorded him. Who do you, why, what do you want to listen to? He says, I want to listen to Curry Bake. <laughs> and this kid, I, I don't know, he's four, six years, some, I mean, I don't even think he was six, he was younger than that. But if, if a child that young can hear, understand, and be drawn toward it, then the message I preach must be simple enough for them to get it. Okay, now here's the thing. If it's simple enough for him... Okay, I'll admit Jesus did give children a slight advantage, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> now, so, but here's what we want to do. So, again, if people would put the, the, if they would put their faith in God instead of a man, then they could get their healing right where they are and not have to go to wherever they think they have to go. Amen? Now, I, I hope you realize I'm doing exactly the opposite of what any uh, church marketing uh, business would tell me to do to build a ministry. Uh -huh. But I'm doing what Jesus did. Uh -huh. Amen? Uh -huh. And I'm saying what he said, and he wanted people to reproduce, and I want people to reproduce to make more disciples so that they can do the job out there and not have to get to me. Amen? Amen. So... Now, the Bible says there is he that scatters and yet increases. Yes. Amen? That's Bible. So, now, <clears throat> notice here. If they have faith in a man's faith and not in God directly, it's because they don't truly know God's love for them. Yes. Number one. Number two, okay? <clears throat> it can be because they don't know the scriptures. They don't know what Jesus has done for them. They don't know who they are in Christ, and they don't know who Christ is in them. Bottom line, now listen, I'm trying to be nice. That's, that's why I played Dr. Sumrall, because that way, you know, he could spank you, and it's easier, okay? Uh, but I'm trying to be nice, but I, I, there's times when you have to get very direct, and there has to be a time we say, okay, look, playtime's over. Now we've got to grow up, and we've got to act a certain way and do what we're supposed to do. Amen? Can we agree with that? Now, all along the way, we're here to help. We don't turn anybody away. We help anybody that we can. We minister to anybody that desires it. At the same time, any ministry we do is supposed to be a emergency room help kind of thing or a stopgap measure until you get to a place where you can get from God directly what he has provided for you. It was never meant to be the way it's supposed to be or the way it is or the way it's going to be. Uh, for the rest of your life. Amen? And you don't want to be in a heathen line the rest of your life. You know, come up, get ministered to, get healed, go back. Next week, something else comes along. You have to get in line again. You don't want to do that. And I don't want to do that. Why? Because that's not helping you grow, and it's not helping the people that aren't in here, the people out there that need you to grow up to be able to help them. Amen? So, now... <clears throat> 
Jesus said. He, he told Pharisees, which how many of you know the Pharisees were pretty well versed in scripture, yeah. right? And he told them, he said twice, he, he said it different ways in different places. But one time he said it this way. He said, you do always err, not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. Now, we could say this. If you don't know the scriptures and if you don't know the power of God, you will always err. Does that make sense? So if you, but if you know the, now, a lot of people know the scriptures, but they don't know the power of God. Well, then you don't always err, but you sometimes err. Some people know the power of God, but they don't know the scriptures. Well, guess what? You're not always going to err, but you're going to sometimes err. Amen? But if you know the scriptures and you know the power of God, you will never err. Does that make sense? See, I backed you right into that corner. You didn't, you didn't even see it coming. <laughs> see it? Okay? Yeah. <laughs> so, now, you can, some people can know the scriptures, but not know the power of God. That tends to be more the case now. Now, admitted, some people know scriptures from a skewed viewpoint. And they read scriptures. They don't read what's written. They read what they were taught it said. And they think they know scripture when they really don't. They know what somebody told them scripture said. And it's because they don't study it for themselves. But a lot of people also don't know the power of God. The people that do know the power of God tend to be people that either function in or they're around people that function in gifts of the spirit where gifts of power or things are happening. Now, here in uh, Acts 1.8, Jesus said that you shall receive power, dunamis, miraculous ability. Do you get that? See, if we say power, people go, okay, power, power to do what? Speak in tongues, power to do No, that's not what he said. He, he did not say you will receive power necessarily. He said you will receive miraculous ability. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So you either, now, these are the options, all right? I like to eliminate the options. I like things very, I hate to say it cut and dried, but I like plain and simple. You know, this is when I would bring out my whiteboard and draw a chart, okay? <laughs> so you have, now, now think about this. He said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost come upon you. You shall receive miraculous ability. So there's a few options that we have. Number one is, let's say uh, if you're before you receive the Holy Ghost, then we can understand why you don't have miraculous ability because you don't have the Holy Ghost. So if you don't have the Holy Ghost, or let's say it this way, if you don't have miraculous ability, it could be because you don't have the Holy Ghost. Can we agree with that? Okay. Now, but you cannot have the Holy Ghost and not have power. Now, you may have the Holy Ghost, and you may have power potential that's in you that you're not using. So you, it could be there. But if somebody says, I don't have power, there's only one reason. You don't have the Holy Ghost. Is that right? They say, well, yeah, but, but I speak in tongues. I receive the baptism of the Spirit. Okay, then you got power. Well, then, but why does it? No, okay. The difference is you have to know how to release power, and you also have to know what can hinder that power, right? Because wrong beliefs can hinder the power. And you say, you say, well, prove that. Well, the fact that you believe that you don't have power just because you don't see power, but yet you say you have the Holy Ghost, there's my proof, right? Because Jesus said that you will have miraculous ability if you have the Holy Ghost. But you're saying you don't have power, you don't have miraculous ability, and yet you're saying you have the Holy Ghost. So that wrong understanding that you can have the Holy Ghost and not have power has, is, has hindered you from walking in power. Does that make sense? Okay, now, in, well, in Acts 2.38, we'll just start there. Acts 2.38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, every one of you. You hear that? He's talking to a crowd. Well, how could he say that? I mean, come on, shouldn't he have said, uh, repent and be baptized, those that, you know, God wants saved. If, he, if you're not one of them, don't listen right now. <laughs> but he didn't say that. He said, Every one of you should repent and be baptized. Isn't that right? So that means everybody there could repent. And it means everybody there should be baptized in the name of Jesus, like he said. Isn't that right? Why? Now, notice here in King James, it says, for the remission of sins. 
in the Greek, it literally means in response to or proof of you have received remission of sins. I'll prove that here, right here in just a minute. He says here, and now what, here's what happens. When you repent, when you have received your remission of sins, when you are baptized, which shows you going into death and coming out walking in a new life after Jesus, right? And he says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So if you have repented and been baptized, then guess what? If your sins are remitted, then you receive the gift. You hear that? So that power is there. Does that make sense? Okay, now, so I'd just like to read it exactly the way it says it and then just apply it. I've found that works best. So, then he says in verse 39, for the promise of the Holy Spirit, and we could even say of salvation, is, to, is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Right? Now, think about this. He says, not just to you, it's to you, your children, and even to all those that are far off. So he said, this is no special thing. See, that's what people say today. Well, but you have to understand, the 12, see, that was the day of Pentecost, and that was just for the 12. Well, the problem was there was more than 12 there. There was 120, and they were all filled. Amen? Amen? Not 119. <laughs> Guess what? Mary was there, the mother of Jesus, and she needed the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Wow. Amen? Amen? Okay, so, now look at, ver at uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now notice this, repent, be converted, and what look at that. That, what does that mean? So that, we could say so that. So you have to repent and be converted so that your sins will be blotted out. You hear that? So no repent, no converted, no sin blotted out. Do you get that? Yeah. Yeah. This idea that people are only going to be uh, you know, convicted or whatever, punished or whatever it is for because they did not accept Jesus, that's not true. Their sins are all still there. Do, do you get that? Their sins aren't blotted out until they repent and are converted. Do you get that? See, cause, why? Because you have to believe that Jesus took your sins. Right. Otherwise, you're still in your sins. And even now we're talking about the book of Acts. We're not talking about before the cross. We're talking about after the cross. D do you hear that? <clears throat> so we have to realize <clears throat> this is a, well, there's a whole lot. It's amazing. See, we think, we look back in the old days and we think, man, you know, Man, what if Wigglesworth had had this truth, you know, the truth we walk in today? He was so far above and beyond most people that he would have had to back up to get where we are. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, and yet we want to hold him up. Oh, Wigglesworth, he was amazing. He was great. Yes, he was. He was an amazing man of God. But I'm telling you, he wishes that he had some of the revelation that's coming because he would actually walk in it. But what do we do? We have all this stuff, and we want to talk about how much we know and how free we are and how good it is and how much we know now. And, oh, we got this doctrine, that doctrine. But Wigglesworth did more. And if you know more, then you, should, you are responsible to do more than Wigglesworth did. So you might want to be a little slower <laughs> at trying to jump on the bandwagon about how great everything is today. Amen? Because some things we have lost. So... Thank you for that resounding amen. All right, now. <laughs> See, your response has nothing to do with how I preach. Because <laughs> I'm preaching to me, I'm preaching to angels, I'm preaching to God, I'm preaching that, that uh, great cloud of witnesses, and my, my preaching has nothing to do with my acceptance or rejection by any human on this earth. Amen? So, there we go. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. It's like that T-shirt that I had. I don't know if y'all saw it. I sent him. I told you about it the other day. It said, "Of course, your opinion matters, just not to me." So, anyway, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, now, Matthew chapter twenty 
2, verse 29. This is the scripture I quoted a while ago. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Now, this is in Matthew. I believe it's in Luke. He actually says, You do always err. Right? So slightly different, but same idea. Now, now we want to get down to what we're talking about, about emotions and how they help or hinder. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Uh, first off, you, and I've talked about this before, but let's say you have a doctor. Now, do you want a doctor that knows what he's doing, is logical, rational, and follows procedure, or do you want one that is emotional and goes strictly by feeling? <laughs> exactly. Okay. <laughs> Imagine that. You know? Well, it looks like it's the appendix. So I'm going to start down here in his heel, and we'll just work our way up, because I think that might be the shortest direction to the appendix. <laughs> nope, that's not logical or rational, and you didn't learn that in medical school. Right. Isn't that right? right? So we want somebody that is logical, rational, and follows procedure. God has procedure. He told us, I read it earlier, if there be any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Isn't that right? It doesn't say do all the other stuff. It says call for the elders. Let the elders deal with it, right? And then you find out if the elders had faith or not. Why? Because they pray if they pray the prayer of faith, then the person will be healed. Isn't that simple? And if they don't get healed, then they, you kick them out and they're not elders anymore. Real simple. Why? Because elders have to be able to pray the prayer of faith. Boy, that's so simple. That's a whole lot better than appointing people. All you have to do is watch and see who can pray the prayer of faith, and then you know they can be an elder. Amen? Yeah, see, that's, way, that's the Bible way of doing things. Uh -huh. That's not man's way of, oh, but he's a big tither, but he wants to be, he wants a position. Mm -hmm. So we'll put him on the board because he's got money. Mm -hmm. No, that's not the way you do it, right? right? Why? Because God can do more with a dollar than you can do with an unrighteous man's million. Right. All right, so example, another example number two, actually. <clears throat> a policeman. Now, a policeman, we expect, and actually both of these examples we expect them to follow procedure, yeah. not emotion. Isn't that right? Yeah. As a matter of fact, some of the cases that we've seen on television lately of policemen that end up in trouble is because many times they get emotional rather than following procedure. Is that right? So there can be situations. We want policemen and doctors to follow procedure, not emotion. Right? Now, <clears throat> see, if you can learn... Now, God gave us emotions. He wants, to experience, he wants us to experience a full range of emotions, but he always wants to make sure that we, the spirit, us, our real person, is in control of our soul, which includes our emotions. So our emotions should benefit us and help us not detract from us or get us into trouble. Amen? <clears throat> so... Now, these are just two examples so far, and I'll give you another one here in just a minute. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Amen? Amen. Now, then in verse 8, notice right in here where he says, Cast all your care. The next verse, he says, Be sober. He's not talking about not drinking, even though that would go along with it. But he says here, Be sober. In other words, be clear-minded. Sober-minded, okay? Be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom you are to resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. In other words, don't think it's some special thing just because you're under attack in a certain way and the devil's come after you. But notice he put that in there. He put in there about you being sober-minded and about resisting steadfast in the faith. He put all that right after the verse where he says, cast all your care upon him. Why? Because if you can't cast your care upon him, you're not going to be sober-minded. You're going to operate out of your emotions. Amen. Now, when I first started, this is some things I had to learn, and I went through, and nobody was, there was nobody to teach me this stuff. That's why... See, I go back and I try to remember the things and share things that nobody taught. And that's why I try to share them is because if I had known, it would have saved me so much. Well, it would have saved lives because people died because of stuff I didn't know. And so when I first started, 
we were getting some results. It was, we're getting good results. Well, it's kind of funny because when I first started, before I even learned really anything that I know now, I mean, I was just studying some of the basic things on healing. And what I learned, I was, I was already operating at about 25% success rate, which the average church, even today, is usually under 10%, usually way under, actually, somewhere around 4 to 6%. So even back then at 25%, I was getting more results than the church that I was going to and didn't really know why, but I was learning and growing and that kind of thing. Then I got a hold of uh, Dr. Lake's material and literally just changed the way I ministered, just changed the way I spoke to healing. In other words, I started commanding instead of praying and begging or even believing and receiving because by that time I had already learned about how to believe and receive and I shall have, I'd already learned all that, right? And at that point, but then the night, and that was probably one of the reasons why I was already at 25%. Well, the night that I learned to command instead of just believe and receive, literally overnight, my success rate went up over 50%. Went up to over 50%, put it that way, because it was over 50% at that point. And so we started seeing some healing. And even then, it was, like I said, just over 50%, which is good. You know, it's like they say, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. <laughs> That's the way it is. So, but at the, my point was this. I, I learned some things that worked, but I still wasn't seeing 100%. And so then I had to go in and start to realize. And so I started trying things out in different places, going to Walmart. That was my test ground. I'd go to Walmart, look for people that were sick. Because you can find, you know, you can go out there anytime you want and pretty much find anybody there. And you're going to find sick people there, especially the town we were in. If you stayed there probably three hours, you'd see everybody in town. I mean, everybody came through there at some point. So I'd go out and find people that were sick and pray for them. And it got to a point where, and as you heard me talk about this before, as I walked through coming in the door, they had those blowers, the air blowers, you know, that in the summer are supposed to keep the, I guess, the flies and stuff out, I don't know, the bugs or whatever. And so it was like I was walking through tear gas. Because every time I would walk in, I'd start crying. No emotion, nothing going on, just start crying. And, you know, and I always liken it to that. I mean, I know it wasn't tear gas, but it seemed to have that effect on me. And then I'd start walking around, and, I, and anytime I started crying, it got to a point where if I started crying going in, I knew I was going to see a sick person there pretty quick, which doesn't take a lot to figure that out, but <clears throat> especially. But that was almost like my cue of, yes, yeah, somebody's getting healed here today. And so I would go find them and minister to them and command. And now notice I didn't yell and shout and that kind of stuff. There was different times I had to learn when and when not to and that kind of stuff. And going to the hospital is how I learned not to shout. Because uh, like I said, if you shout, you, you know, you pray for one person, then you're kicked out. And so they don't, they don't like shouting. Hospitals don't like shouting. I don't know if you know it or not, but that scares people. <laughs> okay. So, but I would go to Walmart and I'll never forget it because I had gotten to this point where we'd, I'd seen many people healed, but I also saw some people die. And when you know that everybody's supposed to get healed, then when somebody doesn't get healed, and especially if they die, honestly, it's devastating. Now, and they may, that may sound a little self-centered. I mean, because obviously somebody died. It's kind of devastating for them too. But... When you know it's supposed to be everybody that's supposed to get healed, and, and yet somebody doesn't, or especially then you find out they died, you have all this stuff. And the first thing, I mean, the devil is right there. He's yelling in your ear, see, doesn't work. And you might have had 100 people just healed the day before. And then you find out this one person died, and he'll tell you it doesn't work, and you'll tend to try to believe him. And instead of going, wait, devil, Yesterday, it was 100 people. Don't tell me it doesn't work. All I got to figure out is, why didn't this work this time? Do you see the difference? I see, he doesn't he didn't remind you about the 100. He just tries to keep it in your face about the one. See, I've, and, and the thing is, growing up with some of the stuff, I say growing up, it was about a 10, well, almost a 20-year period there of growing into some of the stuff. I always heard people like Catherine Kuhlman, how she would talk, they would be, Ten people in wheelchairs, nine would get out, one stay in. She goes, we would, we would rejoice, but I'd go back to the hotel that night and say, God, why not? what about the one? She said that the, the nine would be awesome, but the thrill of the nine leaves quickly, 
but the, the, the bothering of the one stays. And one of the things I learned early on, and this is not to negate the idea that things should be instant, but I did learn, too, that you can't always go by what you see. Why? Because I prayed for people and didn't see any change, and I would go off thinking, God, why? What, what's going on there? And then I'd see them a week later, and they were completely healed, and were healed literally five minutes after I left. But I had been carrying this for two or three weeks sometimes, and they were healed, and, and they didn't tell me, because people don't call you and tell you a lot of times. And so, and then I realized I carried that for three weeks going, God, what about that person? What about that person? And apparently couldn't hear him say, it's already done. Get over it. <laughs> so I had to learn that I did what I'm supposed to do. He's the healer. I'm not. I'm the believer. I believe what he said. It's done. When I walk off, it's done. Amen. Amen? I don't look back at it and go, well, what about I didn't see this, didn't see that. Now, I want to see it, but I don't have to see it. Right. Why? Because more blessed are those who believe and don't see. Right. Amen? I'm not making an excuse. Please understand. I want to see every person in a healing line healed. Why? Because they deserve to be healed because Jesus deserves what he died for. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? So I'm not, I'm not backing off of that one bit. But I just want you to see, sometimes you can't go by what you think you know. Right? And then there's other situations. There was a... And, and again, I've learned that I can overrule some things, but you have to be careful in, in some things, there was a situation where a person died, and they called me to the house, and we prayed, and I, man, I went in there, and I commanded, and we we're going after this, and these were believers also, and they were going after it, and then, and nothing. I mean, and I couldn't even get stirred up, because I know how to stir. The Bible says to stir yourself up, stir up the gift that's in you, basically, right? And so I know how to do that, and usually it can happen that quick. I mean, I'm, I'm ready to go. But this time, there was no, I mean, everything I was doing it was like I was, I wouldn't, I wouldn't acting so anybody could see it, but it was almost like I was trying to make it happen, but I knew it wasn't happening. And it was like, this, I should be stirred up by now. Normally, I would be stirred up. Why aren't I stirred up? And I mean, I had nothing. It was, I was upset, right? And finally, I told him, I said, I'm, I'm going to go for a walk. And I went out back, and there was a railroad track, and I got on the railroad track and just kind of walked down the track and then came back. And I got back, and when I was coming back, it was the strangest thing because it was a uh, woman that had died and the husband was there. And so when I walked back in, I remember because I had no thought in my mind whatsoever. But when I would look at him, I went back in the room. She's still lying in bed. She's dead. And the, there's other people around in the house and that kind of stuff. And so I walk in there and the husband's sitting there in a chair next to her. And I looked at him. And when I looked at him, it's like I knew. And it just came out of my mouth. And I said, what agreement did y'all have? And he looked at me, and his eyes got, <laughs> and he said, well, we, we lived a rough, they, they, they were, ex, well, they were still bikers, but they were, used to be outlaw bike, bikers, and then they got saved. And he said, we, our life was rough. And he said, we've been through a lot. And he said, and there were some things that my wife could not get over. And then he said, and we made an agreement that if either one of us died, the other one would not try to bring them back because our life has been so hard so far and that we, it's a good life now, but we're, we're ready to go. And he said, we made that agreement. And I said, you didn't mention anything like that. He said, I know. He said, I want her back. And so I, I, I got, I mean, my heart went out to him. But they had made an agreement, a vow together, which I knew nothing about until I saw him. And, then I, and even then I didn't know, but I knew it was something. And so then and that's when I asked him, so, and I said, well, look, um, I'm done. I said, I, I got nothing. I said, I've done all I can do. I'm done, right? Now, I don't, I, listen, this is not a theology I necessarily agree with. I'm just telling you what happened. Because I know that there are things that you can overrule, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes even a person's will, which is not good because that, that enters into the fringe of witchcraft right. when you start violating people's will like that, right? And, but I know that you can, I know Wigglesworth, uh, brought back his wife, and whenever because she had died, and he brought her back, Polly. And whenever she came back, the first thing she said is, "Smith, what have you done?" That was the first thing. And he said, "Well, I wanted you back." She goes, "No, it's, it's I, I've got to go. I've got to go." And so they prayed together a bit, and she lay back down, went back, died, went went away. So, and then and after that, he did not start international ministry until after that. After that is when he started traveling, and impacted the world.
right? I'm not saying the two were related. I'm just saying he, he did more at home at that time and at the Boland Street Mission than uh, what he was doing around the world at that point. So anyway, now, so I went into this Walmart. <clears throat> See, I thought I forgot, but now I'm just we're just, <laughs> we're just we're just channel surfing. You know, I know how you do, and you come back and see if the commercials are fast. Right. Okay. okay, so yeah, <laughs> so we're back. To, have to have to work with your attention span. Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> so now, but what happened was I would go in and I I, I had started learning. Uh, Listen, I really entered into people's pain, meaning it hurt me when I saw them sick, even minor things. The, the pain in my spirit, which affected my emotions, was sometimes worse than the pain they were having in their physical problem because I knew it shouldn't be that way. And that bothered me to the point where literally I would break down and cry and different things were going on. And another thing is God was working on me right then because I was very tough-hearted, thick-skinned, and God had to soften me. And he had to make me tender toward people because I did not have that. I just, it wasn't there. And so he had to work on that. But he's still working on that. He's, he's still working. <laughs> okay, but I'm just saying. But back then, it was really, really tough. And because I was raised in a law enforcement background, everything was law, it was very legalistic, everything was this way, and, and it worked great. But... It was not, I had faith, I just didn't have love for people. And faith, which works by love, is what God wants. He doesn't want you to have faith or love. He wants you to have faith through love, right? And so my faith was working, but it was very cut and dried. And there's times for that, but there's an application to it. Now, what I would do is I would literally go in, and I'd read some crazy stuff and, you know, hadn't got it out of my head. Um, that's Reese Howell the intercessor, if you've read that, and he talked about how there, he would go in and enter into their sickness, and that sickness stuff would try to come onto him, and he was partaking of their problems and their pains and stuff, and he thought that that was very spiritual. It wasn't. It was called a, a retaliation attack by the enemy. If it's not right to be on the person, it's not right to be on you. That's right. You ain't Jesus. You don't right. carry it. Jesus carries it. But if you don't know how to take that from them and give it to him, then you will take it from them and you will carry it and it will start to drag you down and it can destroy you. It nearly did me. And so I got to the place where I would do this and I would enter into their, their pain. And, and see, the problem was I thought it was compassion. It wasn't. It was sympathy. But I had faith. So the faith worked even though I was in sympathy. But now what I found is that compassion works much better and has none of the residue of sympathy because sympathy, the thing will keep bothering you. But if you have compassion, then you can deal with the thing and then you can, when you walk off, you can deal with the next thing and not still have the burden of the last thing. But you have to learn how to give it to him, casting all your care upon him. So I, there was a point where I had gotten to where I, I actually, I've started crying and crying and crying and I mean, I'm weeping in a Walmart, right? And so I went to the restroom and I go in, thank God nobody else was in there, and I went into the back stall, shut the door, leaned against the wall, just crying, and literally leaned up against the wall, and then finally just kind of slid down the wall to where I'm sitting in the corner with my head, my arms on my knees, and I'm just sitting, and I'm like, God, you got to stop this. I said, you got to stop this. I said, if, if, if you don't stop this, if I let go and enter into this, they're going to come in here and find me over in the corner babbling, and I'm going to be gone, right? <laughs> Why? Because I couldn't handle it. And so this went on several times, several times. I'd go to Walmart, and it would happen almost every time. It happened a couple of other places, too. And it got to where we would go to a Golden Corral. We had several children and friends of our children, and we'd go to Golden Corral because that was, you know, the, the trough where everybody could eat. So <laughs> when you got lots of little piglets... <laughs> You got to go to the golden trough, okay? So that's what we would do. So, so we would go there, and I'd be sitting there eating, and all of a sudden, I'd start crying. And it literally got to where every time i start crying, I, would, I, I could literally look up, and within a second or two, somebody would walk into view that either had a cane, a crutch, or something where you could see they were physically in pain and an ailment. And it was the Spirit of God, but he was showing me that. Now, here's the thing. You, you might go through a season, but that's not a gift. It's not, that's not supposed to carry on 
permanently. It can be a season where you learn how to be tender and you learn how to be sensitive. And I started realizing what I'm sensing is by my spirit, which can emanate outward, I was picking up what's going on with them by the spirit. Does that make sense? So whenever they walked in, their problem, in their, in, not in their spirit, but their problem spiritually, meaning physical sickness or whatever, that spirit of that thing would hit my spirit and I would recognize it even if I hadn't seen them yet. And then they would, now see, some people call it the anointing, but that's not what it is, right? But that's just, that's how people explain it, but that's not what it is. So uh, I'm trying to hurry here. I have to break this into two parts or three, maybe three. <laughs> so, um, so eventually that would alleviate a little bit. And then as I started traveling, I was ministering or I was talking, I was ministering for a pastor up in Illinois and uh, I started talking to her about it. And I said, yeah, this is going on. And I was just explaining, like, yes, this is going on. And she goes, oh, Brother Curry, she goes, you got to learn to cast that care on Jesus. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, that, that's, not, that's not good. She said, this is going to destroy you. And, and I'm like, I know, I can, I can tell this is what it does. It, it doesn't make me want to do it more. It makes me want to do it less because I know what's coming. And she said, well, you've got to learn to cast that on him. So then I had to go back and literally focus on learning how to minister to a person, pull this thing off of them, but then immediately, even mentally and emotionally, take it to Jesus and leave it with him and go, this is your deal. I'm just here delivering the package of healing, whatever, but this is your deal. This is you know, your ministry, so you carry this, not me. I'm, I'm just here to do my part, right? And so then I got to where I could actually use my emotions rather than have my emotions control me in that. And this is the, the real key. So emotion can be a hindrance or it can be a help. But now, listen, like we said, the fervent prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. Now, what that means, too, is this, that you have to be able to pray the prayer of faith. You have to be able to pray fervently, white hot. The word fervent means white hot. In other words, but that does not mean volume. So you can't tell how fervent a person is by how loud they get. Because in old times, old time Pentecostals, the louder you got, the more power they thought was generated and the more would get done. And that's not true, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be true. It, it, most of the time it's not true. So... But you can be fervent. See, you can be fervent. Fervent just means white hot. And you can be fervent loud or you can be fervent quiet. See, if you're fervent quiet, some people will mistake that for you being stubborn. Because you, you set. In other words, it's like I'm, I'm digging my heels in here and I ain't moving. Now, see, when you get that, when you get that grit of like, let me tell you how it's going to be. Right. See, a, a police officer should never lose his cool, so to speak. In other words, he should, he should never get to a place where he has to yell. If a policeman has to yell, he has lost control of the situation, right? Because now he's just in a yelling match back and forth. A policeman can walk into a yelling match and walk in and talk very quietly and completely de-escalate de the situation. In some cases, not always, but by, by the display of authority, they can bring a situation to a close easier, right? And you can tell. You get a guy yelling that kind of stuff. Let me tell you, I, I used to know, even when I was in martial arts, I knew if I can get you mad enough, number one, you're going to swing first. I'm going to know what you're going to swing because I can tell by your body position what you're going to throw. And so I could make you swing. I would intercept it and hit you. And I made you swing if I could get you mad enough. Now, see, that's exactly how the devil works. See, if he can get you emotional enough to get you to swing, to get you to come out of the spirit and into the natural, into the soul, he's got you. Why? Because that's where he works. Our weapons aren't carnal. They don't work in the carnal realm. The wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God, right? So when you think emotion and you think, if I get mad enough, then this is going to work. No, most of the time it still won't work because now you have entered into the soulish realm, and you have left the spiritual realm, which is your realm of authority. Do you get that? 
Now, let me tell you this. Listen, people think, well, if I get emotional, if I cry, I scream, and I'm begging, and I'm pleading, I'm doing, I'm beating my fist on the floor, and if I'm doing all that, then God will see it, and when he sees enough, then he'll heal this person. Okay, if emotions healed, every child of every parent would be healed because every parent is emotional about that child. Amen? So, and the fact that every child is not healed proves that, he, that emotions don't heal because parents get emotional. As a matter of fact, it usually gets in the way. And when people pray out of emotion, they almost always, not almost, if you're going to pray out of emotion, you're going to pray out of fear. Why? Because that's the carnal realm. And whenever you start praying out of fear, guess what? Here's what happens. Number one, God does not answer your prayer because God doesn't answer prayers based on your emotional content or fear. God does not answer fear prayers. However, the devil does. Why? Because that which I greatly feared has come upon me. Do you remember that? That's from Job, remember? So fear can draw to you exactly what faith can draw to you, but by a different source. Now, the difference is it's not the same result. In other words, faith draws healing, but fear will draw greater sickness, greater pain, greater problems, right? Because if a person's praying out of fear, they're praying that this person is not going to die. Guess what they're fearing? That person dying. Then guess that where that fear is going, and guess what the results are going to be? That person's going to die. Because what you fear comes upon them. And if you're directing that to a person, whether it's your child, neighbor's child, whoever it is, then your emotions are actually bringing more sickness than bringing relief. Does this make sense? Yes. I'm, I'm trying to dig into some of these things that we don't get to talk about much because I want you to understand that this is how important it is. Your emotions were meant to bring you closer to God and not closer to the devil. Does that make sense? Okay, so now, um, <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> I was talking about this here. You know, back then I didn't know how to cast the care of the people onto Jesus, and I was fun functioning more out of my emotions or my flesh, because emotions generally are flesh, and it almost destroyed me. If I had a failure, and I had some, like I said, I would almost quit. Why? Because I'm like, but this isn't working. Why do this if it's not working? What's going on? And I would almost quit. Now, just imagine, because like I said, we had some failures early on. Uh, prayed for some people and they died. Prayed for some people and they got healed, right? But at the same time, the people that died, imagine, because I can tell you, every time they died, I wanted to quit. I didn't want to pray for anybody again. Why? Because it didn't work that time. Even though I had hundreds of cases behind me that I could look at, for some reason, the devil obviously keeps you focused on the failure Imagine, now, I'm talking about early on when we were actually doing this. I'm talking about 1997, 96, 97, going into 97, uh, during that time. Now, think about this, because the ministry didn't really launch to where we were ministering to thousands of people on a weekly basis uh, until after 2000. What if I had actually quit in 1997. How many people, how many more people would have died? How many more people would not have been trained or how many people would not have been trained and how many healings wouldn't have taken place? But see, the problem is you have to be able to emotionally get past. There are people I know right now that had failures in the sense that they prayed for somebody and they died. And let me tell you, you've got to get past that. You say, and I know some people have tried, and, and I'm not saying it's easy. But the bottom, you know how, I, and I will tell you how I got past it. You know how I got past it? I had to go back and go, you know what? That per I, pray, I prayed, and I, I did everything I knew to do. At least I thought, you know, I made mistakes or whatever. But I did what I did, and they died. And then I go back, and I open up the Bible, and I realize that those words have not changed. I'm still required to be the believer. I'm still required to lay hands on the sick. Yeah. I don't care if every person I lay hands on drops dead instantly. Like I said, my healing lines will get shorter much quicker. <laughs> but, but regardless, if that happened, I've still got to be the believer that lays hands on the sick. 
it is not an option. It's not a choice. I don't get to choose what I do in this book. Because once you start doing that, now you have taken it to where it is completely a natural psychological thing and the devil will run you around in circles and you will never be effective for the kingdom of God because he will see to it that your failures are in your face. And, I, and let me tell you, there's people, almost all of our failure, almost every person, that's ever, when I say a failure, I'm talking about a person that died that we prayed for. Almost every person that, we, that I have personally been involved in ministering to them and they died, I can tell you their names. Why? Because it's still there. It's still in the back of my mind. And there's many times, and especially in the beginning when it was my daughter was the only one that we had lost. I remember many times, and you may not like this, but I'm just telling you what I did. There were a lot of times when I would start to minister to somebody and I'd say, you know what? Let me tell you. Erica, this is for you. Erica was our daughter's, our daughter's name. I said, I'm doing this for you. Why? Because I want to make your death the most costly death the devil ever took, you know, life. Does that make sense? And I would go after it. And I and listen, I wasn't praying for people because I loved them. I was praying for them because I hated the devil. I hated sickness and disease. And let me tell you, I'll be honest with you. There were times during that time that I had better results than I do today. Why? Because I would get that set on this thing to go after this thing. And now I have to focus on that to get there. Why? Because we've seen so much results. Now, I know that, you know, like I said, you may not like it, but I'm just trying to tell you, put it all out there. But I can give you names. I can give you names of people. But you know what? Those names of people I know, every one of these names that I know of, they are with the Lord. I don't, I don't know of anybody that I had prayed for that died that is not with the Lord. I, I mean, they were Christian, and I knew it. Now, I'm not saying everybody that I prayed for was. I'm just saying the ones that I know, right? And I can tell you, they would be, <laughs> if I said, well, that person died, so I'm going to quit, I can tell you from heaven, they would be screaming, don't quit on my account. That's what they would be saying. Why? Because they don't want to bear that either. Why would they want to be the person that caused me to quit in that, in that you see what I'm saying? By their death. So if I'm going to honor what happened with them, I'm going to honor it by continuing doing what I'm doing and just get better at it. Amen? Does that make sense? Because you don't honor somebody by saying, well, but what about this person? They died, so I'm going to quit now. So you, you, see, you have to realize God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living for all live before him. Isn't that right? Just because they're not here with us doesn't mean they're not living. May I guarantee you, actually, they are, they are more alive today than they were when they were here. Yes. Amen? That Because now they're not bound by their flesh, and their spirits are, I mean, they're experiencing life. Amen? Amen. So, very quickly here. Um, <clears throat> yeah. If emotion healed, every parent's child would be healed. Instead, the sicker a child gets, the more emotional a parent gets, and the sicker a child usually gets. Most parents are praying out of fear. And they're voicing fear, not faith. And what they greatly fear comes upon them. That's Job 3, 25, okay? Now, and there's, there's some others. I'm not gonna, we are going to cut this into two parts because I'm going to stop here in just a second. Um, but I do want to get over. Here. Here's a good study. I, I did this today, as a matter of fact, this morning. Um, you ought to look up the word loud. Loud, L-O-U-D. And it's amazing what it says. There's not a whole lot. But every time, well, every time it mentions how Jesus did something, he's, it, it, vo vocally or verbally, it always says he did it with a loud voice. In other words, and he did it with strength. And if you look at uh, that word loud, it literally means um, with force. It doesn't mean volume. It means force. And now usually force also includes volume, but it doesn't always. Now, <clears throat> um, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, I mean, how many of you know if... Jesus is love personified, so if that's the case, then Jesus, if love is emotional, or even if faith is emotional, or if emotion heals, Jesus should have been the most emotional person to ever exist. And now, does that make sense? But yet he wasn't. Matter of fact, if you read, he seemed to be almost, as we would say, aloof. I mean, he seemed to be almost sometimes cut off. And, and that's why, because here's the thing. If a person does something you know, all the time, people don't mention it. 
Why? Because it's just, it's so common, they don't mention it. Isn't that right? But when somebody doesn't do it very often, that's what they mention. And it only talks about Jesus weeping twice. So he didn't walk around all the time, oh, these poor things, let me help you. No, but he does say he moved with compassion. What did he say? Well, every time he moved in compassion, you've been through the DHT, you know. Every time he moved with compassion, he cast out a devil, he healed a sick person, he raised a dead person, he did something. Compassion was an act, not an emotion. Amen? Are you getting anything out of this? Yeah. Because there has to be a place where you can literally, listen, if you don't know how to cast the cares, if you're praying for the sick, it will destroy you. It will get to you. And, and it will cause you to literally to collapse spiritually. So you have to be able to separate spirit from soul. And you can only do that with the word of God. Because only the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, right? And so you have to be able to know, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Here, and they say, well, I had to learn how to pray for people on the basis of by his stripes. Not on the basis of, but I love this person. I love them and I want them well. No, see, that's human emotion. See, if you're in heaven, you're going to love everybody exactly the same. So if you love this loved one more than you do that person on the street, now you wouldn't admit it, but you will. If you had to save one or the other, just saying, if you had to let go of somebody's hand, it's probably not going to be your loved one, right? And so, but if you pray out of emotion because you love this person because they're connected to you, that's soul, not spirit. Spirit loves equally across the board and is not a respecter of persons. Do you get that? So you have to be able to, when you minister, I had to learn. When I went down, my dad had um, cancer at one point. My mom had cancer twice. Uh, yeah, and then my dad had cancer at one point. And so I went down there, and God told me on the way down. He said, when, when you go in there, don't go in there as his son. Go in there as my son. And I said, okay. And so when I walked in, my mom opened the door, you know, and usually she'd hug me or whatever, and... I just kind of went right past her. It was very, yeah. Okay, where did I learn this? Wigglesworth. Whenever Wigglesworth went into uh, David Duplessis uh, in Africa, he burst in the door. David stood up. Wigglesworth walked over to him, pushed him back against the wall and prophesied to him. Then said, thus saith the Lord, turned around, walked out the door and shut the door. Then uh, two minutes later, there was a knock on the door. And David sitting there stunned, like, what in the world was that, this prophecy? And he said, come in. And Wigglesworth walked in and said, good morning, Brother Duplessis. Good to see you this morning. And he said, you, you were just in here. Why are you acting like you hadn't seen me? He said, because when I came in here the first time, I came in as a servant of the Lord. Now I'm coming in as your friend. Wow. Do you see how, see, this, this is the mindset. See, we think Faith is this thing and anything and do whatever you want to do and it's all good no matter what. No, no, no. Faith is discipline. Faith has been able to look past something, look past this situation and go in as this person. When I went into my dad, I, had, I walked past my mom. I didn't say, you know, really, I, I don't even think I said hello, actually. I knocked on the door and they opened the door and I walked right on past her, you know, and it was kind of a shock to her too. And so I went over to my dad. He, was sit, he had this easy boy chair that was his chair. And so he was sitting there, and I walked over to him, and I put my hands on his head, and I went after this thing. And I, I'm, telling, I'm not going to do it as loud as I did, but I, it was loud. Why? Because I wanted to drive that thing. I wanted to knock it out with my words. And I wasn't doing it as he wasn't my, my dad. He was a person that the devil was trying to kill. And by the stripes of Jesus, that was my legal basis for setting him free. Had nothing to do with the emotion of family ties or any of that kind of stuff. And I mean, I went after this thing, and I'm like, you devil, you're coming out now. And I got loud and strong, and I put my hands on his head, and I started commanding that thing to come out and for, and for that cancer to die and for him to be healed. And when I got done, I stepped back across and sat down on the couch, took a deep breath, and then I said hi to my mom. And then I said hi to my dad. And when I left her that day, it was so funny because I was on a trip, and my dad turned to my mom and said, you know what? I think Curry's got the gift. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that, that was his concept of it at the time. <laughs> you know? And so, and, and, and he was healed. He, I mean, that's, you know, so, and my mom healed twice before surgery, you know. Uh, God, healed, God healed her, and I, I, I didn't pray for her. God healed her while she was, she said, God, this isn't right. I know you. You've healed me before. 
and this ain't right, that this thing would be on me now. And the doctor came in and said, okay, well, we're ready to take you back. She goes, no, nope, do another test. And he said, we've already done the test. We don't need more tests. We got the test. It's just a waste of time. She goes, do a test or you ain't cutting on me. Right. And he said, okay. So they took another test. No cancer. Yeah. Right? So anyway, so again, there's, there's this aspect. The fervent prayer of a righteous man, a person, is not the emotional prayer or the loud prayer. It's a prayer of faith, which is a prayer of determination. Now, remember, determination is twofold. There's a, a, there's a determination in someone, but if someone says, well, I, we've made a determination in your case, what does that mean? They have made a decision. Isn't that right? So a prayer of faith is a prayer of determination. In other words, you've already determined the outcome. If you haven't determined the outcome, you're not praying the prayer of faith. Do you get that? Okay, it's not the prayer of request in that sense. So <clears throat> you have to, now, you've already term, determined the outcome. You've set yourself to believe that what God has said is the way it is and will be. In the story, that's it, right? <clears throat> it's not the crying, begging, bargaining, whimperings of a person that doesn't know the will of God because they spend their time listening to man or the devil more than they spend time learning God's will or his word. Does that make sense? Most people have abdicated their God-given position and authority because they would rather run with a herd of lemmings than guard the garden that God has given, given them and be the sheepdog they were intended to be. Yeah, that's pretty simple. Isn't that right? But you've got to decide, no, devil, me and my house, uh, you don't come in here. This is my house, right? And it belongs to God and I belong to God. So if you want to do something here, you go talk. See, it's like we, we, we rent our house. We, we rent a house. And if somebody comes in and says, well, we're going to come in and do some work, guess what I'm going to say? Uh, go talk to the landlord. I'm not going to give you permission. Not my house. I rent it, but I don't have the right to okay, you know, alterations. And if somebody comes in and says, well, we're going to tear up the floor and go through that, I'm going to say, whoa, 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 wait, wait. Go talk to the landlord. They own the house. Right. Well, guess what? Guess who owns this house? Right? So I don't even have to think about that. It's like, <laughs> devil, if you want to do something in this house, you go talk to him. I can already tell you what he's going to say. Yeah. Matter of fact, let me quote what he's going to say. Let me just let me tell you what he's going to say. Right? He's going to say, by his stripes. That's what he's going to say. Yeah. And do you get this? Mm -hmm. See, you've got to get that. But it's not emotion. And see, that's why we got so much flack. And I'm going to stop there. Yeah, I am. Well, I'm going to tell you this. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. It says, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Amen. Amen? Now, so you're going to have to decide what you're going to allow, but you're going to have to decide emotionally. See, this is why J.G. Lim, myself, people in J.G. Lim, people look at us many times, and they've said, they've said things like, well, you know, I just, I just don't feel the love. I don't feel the tenderness. I don't feel this kind of... It's like, that's because you don't know what love is. See, you, you, you've been, you know, <laughs> hate Asbury Street out there in San Francisco somewhere. Uh, that's your idea of love, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and putting flowers on cars and stuff. Anyway, it's, okay, that's not love. Love is a decision to do God's will in every situation. Amen? And so you have to decide, okay, how you're going to be, not emotionally. But people say, well, we don't feel this, we don't feel that. Okay, first off, you don't feel anything. Why? Because we don't go by feeling. We go by truth. We go by faith. Isn't that right? And faith is not a feeling. See, that's the problem. Everybody thinks feelings is everything. Well, love is a feeling. Yeah, and that's why you end up splitting as soon as you don't feel the same anymore. Right? Instead of trying to decide what love really is, because love is a commitment. Right. Amen? And so you have to decide these things. But you can't allow these emotions... Uh, to, to dictate what's going on. And so that's why whenever I talk to, to people, and I learned this from Wigglesworth by studying stuff, same stuff you can study. I don't have any secret access to stuff, right? I've read the same books that you did. I just believed them. <laughs> All right? and, th and then I did the same thing. Why? Because he's not a respecter of persons. And if he'll do that through Wigglesworth, he'll do it through me. Amen? Because it's not because of Wigglesworth's name. It's because of the name of Jesus. And Wigglesworth and I have the same Jesus. So he'll do the same thing. So you have to get to that place. And people say, well, I don't feel this, and I don't feel like this. And it's like, why? Because I can walk up to a person, command healing, 
talk, to, talk very roughly because I'm not talking to the person. Right. I'm talking to the sickness or the disease or the problem, and I'm not talking to the person, and therefore I can deal with the situation, and whenever we lay hands, I can walk away and go, it's done, even if you're standing there going, well, did it happen? Did it not happen? I, I don't know if I felt anything or not. I maybe felt something. <laughs> it's like, see, you're wondering, you're wavering, I'm in faith. My faith will work even if you're wavering. Yes. You understand? Yes. That's why I don't stand and talk. How does that feel? How do you feel now? Does that feel better? How, what do you think about that? How, no, I don't get into that. Why? Because I go by this. Why would I ask you? You change every minute by minute. <laughs> this doesn't change. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, if I'm going to ask anything, it's going to be this. Amen? Not you. Because I can catch you on a good day and everything's wonderful. And then the next day, everything's horrible. Okay? With God, he's always the same. But you have to be able to learn. I'm the doctor that comes in, does the operation, does the procedure. Think about this. You're up here in the healing line. It's kind of like a doctor's office. Kind of, right? Only difference is you're not in offices sitting there, which you're paying for, right? You pay, up here, you don't pay for this space. But if you're in a doctor's office, you're paying for him to have that space so you can feel special and private and, and you can feel this is your little room, and he comes in, and how, long, how much time does he spend with you? Yeah. It's like that much time, isn't it? Yeah. And I want to say, so then I'm looking at your chart. Yep, okay, here's what you say. How's that going? Okay, yep, all right, so here's what we're going to do. He, he does. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> oh, are you in pain right now? Oh, I know you are. <laughs> does it hurt? It hurts bad, doesn't it? It hurts bad. I know. And I, I'm spending 10 more minutes with you than I have to, so your bill's going to be a little higher, too. So <laughs> dude, my time is valuable. So I don't know why. Every time I start talking about that, I'm going to Bill Clinton now. Oh, no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I say, yeah. What can I say? I just pictured Trump as a doctor. <laughs> He'd get it done. What can I say? <laughs> Got a problem with your finger? We're not sure. We're going to take it off about here. We're going to take it off about here. Because <laughs> it's going to be huge. It's going to be huge. <laughs> we have totally derailed. Anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> the healing line, yes. When you're standing in the healing line, the doctor doesn't spend much time with you. He comes in. That's why he does it. He doesn't want you to know how much time he's spending with anybody else. So he comes into your, and you, you're, that's your moment. And then he leaves and he goes somewhere else to somebody else and talks to them. And he goes through. And you know what? He's already, he, how does he know what he's going to do? You know what? You know how he knows what to do? It's in books. Right? He went through some school or something. Hopefully. Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> Anybody can print a certificate. Anyway, just say, I know I'm building your faith in your doctor, I know. So anyway, but everything he's going to tell you, you know what he does? It's, it's, okay, it's either in a book, but now it's like he'll go over and sit down and Google it. Your doctor's going to Google your problem, which you could have Googled at home. Amen? But he's going to go and look it up, or it's going to be written down somewhere, and he's not going to treat you special. He's going to look at what this is, and he's going to look at it before, and he's going to treat you like everybody else. He may take your body size, body temper, and that kind of stuff. He may take that into account of how much to give you, but overall, it's going to be the same thing. He's going to do the same thing. Why? Because it's logical. It's right. Yeah. You know, and unless he needs a new golf cart. Now, that's, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> anyway, I know. I'm just digging in. Here. I'm trying to stop. But does this make sense to you? Listen, we've got this written down. There's nothing special. I hate to, I know, I know everybody in this room is special. I know that, right? I know it. But I hate to break it to you, but your case ain't special. Your case was covered under Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5, 11 and 12. That's your case. If your case isn't covered under Isaiah 53, 11 and 12, guess what? You're still in sin. So your case was covered there, and if it's covered there, so is your sickness. You're covered. Amen? Amen? And we know exactly what to do, and I know how to do it. I've done it hundreds of thousands, maybe even over a million times now. I know, I know what I'm doing. We know how to do it, and I'm not going to do anything different. Aren't you glad? Why? Because I get good results. 
when you get good results, you don't want people to change, right? I don't want, well, you know what? I'm kind of bored with all the results. I'm just going to try something new. Who, who wants to volunteer for me to try something new on? No. no, I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but even if I had a doctor, I wouldn't want him going, hey, I got this new ex exploratory uh, medicine stuff. Uh, you know, would you like to try it? Yeah, sign me up. Yeah, I want to try that. What's it going to do? Well, we have no idea what the effects are going to be, but it ought to be interesting to watch. It's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I don't think that's me. I don't, you know, I, I, you know, it's like you don't want to buy the, the, the car the first year it's out. You want to wait to the third, you know, second, third. Why? Because they worked out all the bugs. Yeah. Well, that's what you want with the sickness and disease and the, vitamin, and the uh, vaccines and that kind of stuff. You know, I don't want to be the guinea pig. You know, if you want to do it, that's fine. But, you know, well, I'll be honest with you, I'm not even going to take the third, fourth, tenth generation. I don't care. <clears throat> Why? Because I've already been inoculated with the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen? Yeah. I'm good. Amen? So, anyway. Did you all get anything out of this today? Yeah. So, amen. Well, we just don't want your emotion to hinder. So you have to learn to be able to cut that off and go by procedure. And the procedure is real simple. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Man, if, if, if doctrine would only be so simple. Amen? So, all right. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's pray. Father, your word is true. And we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father that you are so <laughs> cut and dried on this stuff, that there's no if, ands, or buts. There's just shall, and we thank you for it. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for those that are under the sound of my voice, whether they're present or distant. Sickness and disease has to leave their body. It has no right to stay. And by the stripes of Jesus, they were healed, so therefore they are. And in Jesus' name, Father, we thank you even right now that anyone that wants to walk in your truth and wants to be free and wants to be made immune that it's by the blood of Jesus that you can even become immune and so Father we thank you that right now anyone that would like to become immune spirit, soul and body can do so simply by making your son their Lord and Father we thank you Lord doesn't just mean forgive me it means lead, guide, give me the commands, and I'll obey them. And we thank you for the book that has the commands. So in the name of Jesus, if you've not made Jesus Lord of your life, do it now. Make him Lord. Don't go by emotion. Don't go by how you feel. Well, I don't feel like I don't know. It no, has nothing to do with it. We're talking about eternity. It has nothing to do with feeling. It has to do with what is right. And it's not right that you end up going to hell after Jesus has paid for you to go to heaven. So in Jesus' name, just make him Lord. And Father, we thank you that your word is working in the hearts and minds of people, even as they leave this place and as they go forward. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.